<laughs> Hello, Eugene. It's very lovely talking to you, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to having you at least remotely, uh, remotely with us in the Mondaneum. So I will uh, come with my first question. When was the first time you heard about Paul Audley's work? Why, well, I, I, so long ago I can't remember. Uh, I don't know, don't specifically know, but I know that uh, Boyd Rayward was interested in that a long time ago, and uh, I had a, I, I don't remember exactly, but I, I have a copy of a Tratate in Documentation which is uh, Audley's uh, opus, grand, magnum, magnum opus. And uh, uh, I know about him as a, he's, he's a predecessor to Wikipedia. He was Wikipedia before there was Wikipedia. <coughs> Anyhow, I wish that I had met him, but I didn't. So, so, so how was your work inspired by him? Could you? Well, you know, I sponsored a, a lectureship or a fellowship in his name at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. That may not be known to this group, but it's a museum and a, and a research organization in history of history of science, which is located in Philadelphia, and uh, also uh, we sponsor a Paul Ortlay lecture at the University of Illinois. That I did it together with Boyd Rainwood. So, and he, he's the one that was the inspiration for it. So, what do you find most impressive of Paul Audley? He's a somewhat an unbelievable man. To just imagine that in 1933 already, he was talking about television in libraries. No one. No one even heard of television in those days. So who knows? And uh, what else can I say about him? You have to read his, his work, the remarkable work. Okay? Now we hope to have you in the Mondaneo, maybe next year, uh, Eugene, and then having a look also on his drawings. He was also a, a big uh, visual, uh, visual visionaire. Yeah. So let me come to my next question. So uh, I'm a big fan, as you as you very well know, of the essays, and I often go back to them and I read them. But there are you wrote so many of them. What was the function of the essays at that time? You introduced them, and was it more a joy or more a burden to do them? Well, it never was a burden for me because first of all, I had a very a very helpful, significant group of people working with me, the editorial group, uh, including David Pendlebury, and among other people, was so helpful to me. So, and I think I acknowledged their names at the end of every essay. So, uh, it was not a burden. We used to have weekly meetings, and it was a lot of fun to have these meetings. We had regular topics that we did every year, uh, most cited papers in uh, life science or life or cited papers in mathematics or whatever. So uh, it was certainly not a burden to me. Okay. So the ISI have been, has been very pioneering in a lot of different, not only techniques, but also how the digitization, the, auto, the, automa, the automation was em, embraced. Nowadays, we have even greater possibilities. There is a lot more material digital available. What do you see as the next steps uh, in information service or information science, um, both the industry as well as the, as the academic discourse should actually tackle? Well, information, we never, we never have enough information. Always, there's always a question of uh, too much information, too little. And you know, we already thought about this. Saul Harnett talked about it in 1952 or three. Uh, he, he wrote a paper, Technical Information, Too Much or Too Little. 
By the way, about my essays, you know, one of the main reasons I wrote these essays is because when I travel in Europe, especially in East Europe, uh, a lot of the people who saw these essays were readers from the countries that, where even Science Magazine and Nature were forbidden. So people, for some reason, the censors didn't pay attention to the fact that current contents was a bibliography, so they didn't think it had to be censored. So that's why whenever I traveled, people always told me how much they depended on me for a window on the West. So that was very important to me. And so later on, well, we, we never, we never tried to offend anybody because we knew, they knew what was going on. I didn't have to tell them about uh, what was wrong with communism. So uh, uh, that, that's a very important part of the history of uh, current contents. So coming back to the new technological challenges, what do you think is the most exciting which is now possible and which wasn't possible 20 or 30 years ago? Well, now, now you, we can do can add full text searching. I mean, we're still not there because you can't always get access to the original full text. Uh, maybe Google scanned it, maybe they didn't. But uh, uh, you still have to go through your local library. Uh, an individual doesn't have that kind of access unless the, the journal says it's free. So open access doesn't mean it's open. It means that you pay for it and it's open. And uh, so I think that we have a lot of uh, luck to overcome there. Uh, how we can solve the political problem because you have the private publishers versus the nonprofit versus the uh, government. It's a very complicated uh, question. But uh, technology is moving very quickly. And now, you know, we can. And talk to a computer, you can get, get answers to your questions. And although I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not very well advanced in technology myself. My wife helps me. So, what can I tell you? I think that uh, the availability of all these texts will make it much easier to reconstruct history. Uh, I, I, this is one of the reasons why I, uh, together with uh, Alexander Pudovkin and a student of his, we invented uh, his site, which is very important to me, uh, but it's uh, only available if you know how to use it. So I won't say anything more about it, but I can tell people if they want to use his site, they can by they can contact me or contact Pudovkin. Okay, we will definitely convey this, this message. And the final question. So you have, you have still seen World War II. You have seen the Cold War. You were always building bridging. You have been a an, an pioneer in an information industry. You have been innovator of a new principle, the citation indexing. Eugene, what would be your advice to the new generation of information scientists who are trying to follow your footstep? Well, you should read my 15 volumes of essays. <laughs> it's free on the web. You can get it. It's all there. You don't have to wait for the text. Uh, if you have a problem with any of the links, you should tell me. We can correct them. So once I, I don't know why, but sometimes the links break. But, uh, 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 we try to correct them right away. Anyhow, I, I think that uh, I don't have to tell the younger generation what to do with the new technology. I'm sure they'll be able to figure that out for themselves. It's, it's always, yeah, I think it's somewhat foolish to try and predict the future. You know? Thank you very much for this interview, Eugene, and we are looking forward to having you in Europe another time. I want to close. I say I wish you all a happy conference. I'm really sorry I can't be there today, but uh, I certainly plan to visit the museum sometime in the next year. So 
Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much, Jean. We'll be in touch.